We've been graphing in the complex plane recently and this is one of the equations that we encountered and I walked you through in class how we could go about working out the subset of the complex plane, the, the set of points that would satisfy this equation and we did it in a very visual and intuitive way. But I know that is quite frustrating to some people because it can sometimes feel as though you know, if you hadn't been shown the kind of the trick or the insight that would help you understand where um, the points were on the complex plane that would satisfy this equation, you just wouldn't know where to begin. And that's one of the key strengths of taking an algebraic approach to things. You don't necessarily need to know um, in advance what kind of a shape you're going to end up with. You just kind of start to simplify things and then the algebra takes care of the rest. Now, um, there are huge problems with that approach. Usually it is very long and drawn out. Um, and as a consequence, it can also be very error prone because the more steps there are, the more places there are for mistakes to creep in. However, um, it's really important that you do get a handle on how to do these kinds of things um, so that if you do encounter an equation, you're like, I don't even know where to begin. This doesn't look like the kind of shape, this is not a, a circle or a parabola or a hyperbola that I've you know, encountered before just with different numbers. Um, I might need to know how to work out the shape of something from scratch. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to do with this particular equation. Um, I hope that part of what I'm gonna do is convince you why the algebraic approach is uh, not ideal um, and it has significant problems with it. But if you ever want to lean on it, um, I'll show you kind of the skeleton of how I go about it. Now, just in case um, you haven't seen the, you know, the previous lesson on which this one is kind of following on from, let's review, right? We encountered this equation and then to think about it in, a, in visual terms, what I did was um, I added arg of z minus three to both sides, which then presented me with um, this argument being equal to this argument. I rephrased it slightly on this line just to show um, more specifically what the reference point, um, in this case it's negative i, in this case it's three, what the two reference points were for this particular subset of the complex plane. And then what we did was we explored visually. Uh, we used some uh, software to think about if I moved Z to different places, where could it be that I would find the argument to that particular complex uh, point that I selected, where would the argument be the same from minus I and also from three? Now, where we ended up with our conclusion was that this was the subset of the complex plane that satisfied all of those. If you just have a think, for example, about let's, uh, let's pick a point over here. Um, I'm saying that that could be a potential value for z and when you think about the angle measured to that point from say 3, it's going to be this angle here from the positive real axis upwards. It'll be uh, this little angle here and if you have a think about uh, the argument from, um, I don't know why that says i, that should be negative i, let's fix that shall we? There we go. Um, if we again have a look at the argument from that point, um, as you're headed up, if you aimed properly, that would help, um, on the same line and you measure from the same positive real direction, um, you can see this is literally just corresponding angles on parallel lines. So that's why the angles are the same, the arguments are the same, and you could make the same argument, uh, you could make the, the same point um, if you were on the other side, use the same logic, right? All of these points on these two black lines are right. However, we did notice that in the middle here, um, if we, we picked a spot like this, um, the argument from minus i would be different to the argument from three. And so we excluded that little um, interval in the center. So this was our conclusion, right? When you have something presented to you in this form, um, the two points here, negative i and three in this case, are joined by an interval. And to get the set of points or the locus that is relevant to this, you extend that interval out. So you end up getting these two rays. Here's one ray heading in, off to infinity in that direction and then here's the other ray heading in the opposite direction. You extend the interval out and then the interval itself gets excluded. It's not part of the set of points that you're after. So this is what we ended up with. But how would we go about this without just sort of appealing to that hand waviness or the, the fact that you already know what this shape should be? How can we use algebra to help us? Well, what we need to do is um, a couple of things. Uh, number one, we will be doing a lot of algebra, um, but number two, we actually need to take a step back and uh, re-establish or review some foundational knowledge that we'll need to use in the course of our algebraic proof. And we're gonna do something which we're very fond of doing in mathematics and particularly in this topic. We're gonna look at complex numbers from two different perspectives that will give us insights that help us with this question. So. Let's have a go at doing this from scratch. Um, and if you're following along with notes, uh, let's call this the algebraic technique. 
All right, now, um, what is this foundational piece of knowledge that I was alluding to? Um, the foundational piece of knowledge is that we have to deal with um, this Cartesian equation, x's and y's and all that kind of thing, but we have to get there via understanding the arguments. I mean, this equation that was presented to us here, it's all about arguments. There's no modulus or anything else uh, in sight, no conjugates or other things like that, where the algebra is relatively simple. So I, I need to work out what algebraic tools can help me to deal with the arguments in this question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, let's remember, if we take a complex number, um, and if the complex number is, say for example, a plus ib, if I have it in rectangular or Cartesian form, I can relate that to its, um, its argument by stating the same complex number in, in a different form, right? Um, I could say in polar form or in exponential form. I'm gonna use polar form here just because I think it will tease out the relationships a little more obviously. So a, an arbitrary complex number stated in polar form would be r, cos theta plus i sine theta. So instead of a horizontal and a vertical component like you have in Cartesian form, we've got our modulus here and we've got our argument in here. And so long as you know what direction you're facing in and how far you should go in that direction, that uniquely defines uh, a complex number on the complex plane. So this is uh, foundational, how do I get this to help me? Well, I'm gonna make this comparison between the left and the right hand side by doing a bit of an expansion here. So if I just, uh, expand these brackets, I get this. And what you can see is I can uh, take the real terms on the left and the real terms on the right and I can say, well, these must be equal, right? The real parts on the left and right uh, and then the imaginary parts on the left and right, which are respectively here, there's the real parts, and then here. Mm -hmm there is the imaginary parts. I can make the comparison between them and say, well, these two must be equal because there's no other part in the equation for the imaginary components to come from. And uh, same with these parts, these must be equal, okay? Now, uh, rather than go and just say, you know, a equals this, uh, B equals this. I'm gonna go one step further and you'll see why in a second. I'm actually gonna do a bit of a division here, right? So I'm gonna say, uh, we'll use these colors here, right? Um, B, over A. This is the uh, imaginary part divided by the real part. So in fact, I should say that I'm comparing the real and imaginary part. If I do a division of the imaginary component by the real component on the left-hand side, that is equivalent to doing a division of the imaginary component divided by the real component on the right-hand side. So I'm gonna get R sine theta on the numerator, and then I'm going to get R cos theta on the denominator. So at this point, I can simplify this out because I'm getting R's that cancel, one, two, and then sine theta over cos theta, of course, I can just write this as tan theta. Okay, now, how is this useful to me? Well, um, remember, theta in this case is the argument that's relevant to um, this particular complex number. So I can start to get things in terms of, you know, what my original question looks like. You can see this is written in the form of argument of a number in rectangular form. So I'm going to um, take that and I'm gonna write it here, sort of, um, instead of writing theta, even though theta is a much more succinct way of saying it. Uh, I'm gonna write it on um, the left-hand side. So I'm gonna say tan, instead of writing theta, it's the argument of the complex number that I started with, which I can either say as r cos theta plus i sine theta, I can put it in polar form, or I can write it in rectangular form. They're the same number after all, right? So I'm gonna write it as a plus i b. Tan of that argument um, equals b on a. And at this point, I want to remind you um, that we strenuously cautioned you in using um, you know, tan inverse to find out what the argument was, because if, for example, um, you had some complex number and b over a was equal to one over two. If you did um, tan inverse of that, you would get an angle out, um, you would get an argument and it would be in the first quadrant. But if you had a different complex number and it was negative one over negative two, if that was the imaginary and the real components on the numerator and the denominator, if you put this into tan inverse, you get exactly the same result. You'll get a first quadrant angle, even though if your imaginary component is negative one and your real component is negative two, you're not in the first quadrant. You are in the third 
quadrant when both are negative. So we said don't use this to actually find the arguments unless you know you're in a real hurry or you have no choice. However, um, what I've got here is, is always true. I've not introduced any inverse trig functions. It's just regular old tan of an angle equals this ratio.